take me a little bit into how the process is when you take a, a car engine yeah. and then you know convert it to to uh, to an airplane engine. Sure. Well, basically, uh, what we do is uh, rely as much as we can on the Honda and Mitsubishi technology and their engineering and their you know testing in millions of cars around the world and. In fact, we try to do as little as we can when it comes to converting the engine from a car engine to an airplane engine. Uh, basically, the process starts by using used engines. That doesn't mean uh, junkyard engines as in the old days where things went to the junkyard when it was totally unusable. It's basically the latest year of the model engines, uh, like a 2018 Honda Accord, uh, 2018 Mitsubishi engine. Those are the engines that we buy with uh, two to 10,000 miles. Things that where the uh, insurance companies decided that uh, the engine is not, or the car is not rebuildable, uh, but the engine compartment was never really touched in an accident. They, obviously these cars have been in some kind of an accident where they were hit on the side or in the back or uh, uh, even even a lot of engines we get, we get uh, shipping damage when the cars came in from different countries and, and things like that. So that's how the process starts. Um, we use uh, uh, technology that you basically, if you had to go and buy it nut by nut, bolt by bolt, would cost a tremendous amount of money <clears throat> because we can start out with a really nice engine um, that comes in here with the different uh, uh, salvage companies to, and the insurance companies that deliver them to us we can start the process from an engine that's already assembled, that has no damage, that uh, has been thoroughly checked out, and then put our machine parts and our uh, wire harness and our, our ECU that operates the engine. We can then take, for instance, a prototype approach would be to pick an engine, uh, go through the, the drafting of the gearbox, the uh, lay out a wire harness table, um, put the engine on a dyno and get the proper uh, pro uh, protocol in the ECU that's going to operate the engine. For instance, with the turbo engines and the 130, it's very sophisticated, that process, because those are uh, direct injected engines. The little Mitsubishi engine is a port injected engine, so that process is more traditional and, uh, and easier to, to do. So that's the, the basic steps that, that happen. We, we don't, we're not a machine shop. Um, we're not an engine rebuild shop. Uh, we design the parts that go on existing engines. Our customers have faith in Honda. They have faith in Mitsubishi. Uh, they have faith in us uh, that we can tie these uh, things together and then produce uh, modern, uh, lightweight, uh, very fuel efficient and powerful airplane engine from those components. I, I kind of tend to think that engines that have, you know, made and mass produced, which is what we do, and, and that's really key to what I'm trying to say about what we do. It's mass produced engines that you can buy parts for everywhere and anywhere and for a reasonable price. So back then we had, uh, or Viking made an engine called the Viking 110, and it was a 1.5 liter Honda, and it was really, really uh, designed to be lighter than in the car. We machined pretty much every part of that engine other than the crankshaft and the block. We made our own sump, we made our own uh, chain housing, cover plate with engine mounts for aircraft use and so forth. And ended up being a good engine. Was out, we produced it for many years and then decided that, you know, uh, we, we kind of had lost sight of the idea of keeping as much of the car engine as possible. So now we, we went on another search for the lightest of our engines. Rather than taking one and making it lighter, we just picked an engine that was smaller, which is the Mitsubishi 90 horse. And we left the Honda Fit engine uh, upright the way it is in the car. In fact, all of our engines went from, um, uh, the 110 was the only horizontal engine. It was an upright engine that was made to lay horizontal. Uh, then decided to make a new gearbox with a third gear, an either gear, and because we now can raise the thrust line, there was no need to lay the engine on its side, which was a game changer for our business because now we can produce the engines quickly, reliably, uh, and they can be just like they sit and operate in the car, meaning that when uh, someone wants an engine, it's, it's instantly done, we can ship it out and uh, just simplify the process and made that whole thing easier. And currently at Viking, uh, the, the current production line is the, like I was mentioning, the 90 horse, 
uh, derived from a Mitsubishi car. Uh, the uh, 130 horsepower, which is a Honda Fit, and the uh, 150 through 180 horsepower, which is all the same engine, but we can take out a different horsepower depending on the amount of boost that we're those engines are producing because th that particular engine is a turbocharged engine. Um, the difference between, let's say, the 130 horsepower fit engine, which is also a 1.5 liter, and the turbocharged 1.5 liter is that the 1.5 turbo is a different animal altogether. Honda produced a turbo engine from scratch. Uh, it happens to have 1.5 liter like the fit engine but everything else is different. It has uh, uh, sodium filled exhaust valves, it, uh, the exhaust is on the opposite side of the cylinder head, it's a different block altogether, different bearings, so forth and so on. So there's an engine that's made and designed by Honda to be turbocharged. Comes with a very, very nice digital wastegate for the turbocharger which we program through our ECU. So the basic engine can take care of itself even at altitude. You, if you want to maintain uh, four inches of or, or uh, four pounds of boost, the engine will do that automatically by itself. And pretty sophisticated, nice engine. Um, the uh, 90 horse we now have uh, sized for airplanes like a 701, Zenit 701, the uh, uh, Russian-made SP30. Uh, the uh, Sonexes, um, you know, the, the small Highlanders, and a whole lot of kit planes that uh, either are in production now, like the Kit Fox, or earlier airplanes, like the earlier Kit Foxes, um, things like that. Now, it seems like the trend is to make uh, even airplanes that used to be smaller, like the Rands and so forth, they all kind of uh, have grown slightly because of the industry and uh, us as Americans, except me, have grown. <laughs> They're bigger and, and taller and whatever. So, but you know, like the earlier Rands, they were, uh, they were smaller, the Kit Foxes were smaller, the Zeniths were smaller in the 701 and, and, uh, and, and all that. And I think that's, that's perfect for our 90 horsepower engine. So that's where that's going to go. And I would, I would tend to recommend people stay with the horsepower and weight that they should have, you know. Like, like we do sell our 130 for the Zenit 701. People want that extra power. They want maybe put it on Amphib floats and so forth. But, but there's no, but it's, it's a compromise, you know. You put that 90 in and it'll, everything will balance out and it'll fly beautiful. And, um, but yeah, we do have uh, smaller planes that have bigger engines for very specific purposes. Like for instance, Deal, Dean Phillips in, in uh, uh, over in, um, uh, he's not in Australia, he'll kill me if I said that, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, Dean Phillips in New Zealand uh, is flying uh, a 701 with a 130. And sure, he wins all the sole competitions because he has tons of raw power and lots of thrust, but uh, you end up putting a little bit of weight in the tail and, and all that, so yeah. And then uh, the bigger engine, like the one I'm standing by here in the Zenit Super Duty is, um, it's also a 1.5 liter engine. It does have the extra horsepower, but with that comes a little extra weight too, because you know you you, you start running intercoolers and turbochargers and uh, and extra equipment to get that power, and uh, it starts weighing more. A, a heavier duty reduction gearbox because of the extra horsepower, and uh, and on and on and on. But perfect for the Super Duty and, uh, and a host of other uh, airplanes that are like, like, like this, like a Bush airplane type of thing that can handle a little bit more uh, weight up front and needs the thrust that a geared engine will give you. Uh, lots and lots of thrust. This can actually produce 800 pounds of thrust. Uh, we don't normally set it up for that much thrust, but it is possible to get that kind of thrust out of this airplane, this engine combination. As far as pricing, you know, we, we hate to think that people are picking our engines because it's the most economical, uh, bang for the buck, least expensive, all I can afford, whatever. Um, yeah, that might be true, but at the same time, uh, you have to realize that you are getting the absolute latest in technology, you're getting the most engine for the money. Um, the, these engines, if you look at some uh, YouTube videos, they're made in, uh, uh, they're made here in the US. Uh, they're, it's, a, it's a fantastic engine. They, they produce more power reliable than any other engine that, that's around in as far as the aviation industry. You're not going to get direct fuel injection. Uh, if you're not familiar with direct fuel injection, uh, maybe look that up because it goes right into the cylinder, so it's totally different uh, uh, 
ball game than, uh, than port injection or carbureted. It's the future, it's by far the future. Um, our little engine is around $10,000, our, our next in line, the 130 is somewhere around 12, and then you get up into the 17, 18 uh, for the big turbocharged engines with the intercoolers and all that. So it's very, very uh, economical, uh, yet um, you are, you're not getting, uh, you're, you're not, you should not ever have to think that you're like taking some kind of a compromise in in technology or in longevity or in anything uh, because uh, the term true aircraft engine doesn't come from anything you know the true aircraft engines were initially uh, the Wright brothers I think there was pretty much a car engine and uh, all the Warbirds flew liquid cooled motors or engines and you know so what happened to become a true airplane engine after the war like uh, you know, horizontal opposed air cooled light coming was actually a generator motor or engine. So there's no such thing as a real true. And now, of course, with light sport, and you look at the 912 Rotax, it's high RPM, it's liquid cooled, oil cooled, uh, air cooled, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. You know, it's a great engine, but it's, there's no such thing as like what is a perfect or true or uh, supposed to look like uh, aircraft engine. Now, Viking specialize in. Not just the engines, but, but we don't we don't let you hang like there. You know, basically, if you're building a 701, uh, Alyssa is going to help you piece together the the perfect firewall forward uh, package for your aircraft. You're gonna uh, get your engine mount, your fuel system, your electrical uh, pieces, and your cowling, um, and lots of video instructions of how to install and operate this particular engine for your airplane. And that that goes for uh, most all home built airplanes all kit built airplanes we either have the engine mount or we'll make the engine mount most of them we already have them for uh, you know uh, you'd be surprised like uh, kit foxes and highlanders and uh, and things like that they all have very similar cowlings we either have a cowling that fits exactly or we'll have a cowling that's very close so but no we specialize in not just the engine uh, in fact we we pride ourselves in that we do a lot of YouTube videos showing you how much we test these uh, engines no matter how we, much time we put into uh, perfecting the engines, uh, if, if we're not pilots, if we don't fly, there's absolutely no reason for you to buy an engine from us. You know, if we have them in, uh, in cars or uh, golf carts or uh, airboats or whatever, that's not flying. Okay, flying is what puts a lot of testing on the engine. The engine's running hard. Uh, the engine needs to be cooled properly. Uh, proper oil coolers have to be fitted to the engines if they need them. Uh, proper air ducting to the radiator. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And for us to just sell you an engine and expect the customer to figure all this out, it, it would be uh, it would be almost crazy.